Uh, Josie Mayday says, I just got back from wrapping my first short film as a sets props designer fabricator, and it was absolutely incredible. Congratulations. Uh, I made an elevator interior set complete with functional button panel and floor indicator. Dude, dude, that is awesome. It was my first time on set with any kind of leadership position, and I definitely struggled with the pressure of a whole crew waiting on me my team for a shot, especially when running behind. Do you have any advice for keeping your head on straight when it feels like the whole weight of the production is on you at one time? Yeah, that is a lot of pre-production. Once you're on the set, you're just on the set. Like that's that reality. The, the advice that I would give you is, uh, comes from Tom Wamsgams from uh, Succession. My favorite part about the last season of Succession is every time Tom tells some essential truth about himself. He's played by Matthew McFadden. Um, I've been Team Wamsgams since the beginning of Succession. I love that character. He's an amazing, he's an amazing character. And at a certain point in the season, sorry for spoilers, but it's aired so far, he's talking to uh, Sarsgaard. And Sarsgaard is like, can you be my pain sponge? Can you run my company for me? And Tom says, yes, I can. I would be good at that. Um, I, I'm good at that because I worry all the time about everything, all night long, every night. And he's not wrong about what it is to be a supervisor on a thing. Um, worrying that you haven't done it correctly is like, it's got to be the water that you swim in. And you like the moment you feel like I don't have to worry anymore, that's precisely when you're about to be reminded why you needed to be worrying. Um, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a, a collaboration with a couple of other YouTube channels right now. And it's requiring me, all this will be revealed soon, but it's requiring me to make again a thing that I used to make on Mythbusters all the time. And it's something I'm very practiced at making. I've made dozens and dozens and dozens of these things, but they are, they are potentially dangerous objects. And in doing this, I'm both waking up this old part of my brain and being like, oh, look at that. I know all the things that could go wrong with this. Okay, cool, this is awesome. And at the same time, I'm spending every day in a slight amount of abject terror of like, is there something essential I am forgetting that I will need on site when I travel to another state to execute this object, to do this thing? Um, and the answer is, I think I've gotten everything. I keep making lists. I keep on not finding things I haven't taken care of, but that doesn't mean there's not something I have forgotten that's essential. Um, worrying. It's like, you've just got to build it into your system that you have, that there's something you haven't taken care of. If you are always expecting that there's something you haven't taken care of and you're trying to eliminate it, when something shows up that you haven't taken care of, you're already in the right state of mind. You're not in the, ah, oh, what, what, wait a minute, right? Like, that's not where you want to be. Um, the whole crew standing around waiting for you to execute your thing, it's the worst. It's the absolute worst. Um, I very much enjoyed when we did the collaboration with Corridor Crew and we were doing the knife nose slice from Chinatown. I really appreciated that uh, when it was time for Nico to slice my nose while Ren was holding me and Nico gets the knife up and I explain, so now you're not shooting a plate, you're shooting a thing in which the beat of how this moves and when your hand squeezes and all the things that happen in concert really, really matters. And by the way, every time you do it, you're gonna cover my face with fake blood. It's gonna to need to be cleaned off. There'll be a reset time. And imagine that now, instead of being in my shop with five of us standing around, you're on a big soundstage and there's 75 to 150 people in the room and they're all silently, impatiently waiting for you to do your thing. And I got to watch Nico take in like, oh, oh, this is what it is to be in the barrel. That's the phrase in Hollywood. When, it's, when everyone's waiting on your thing, it's your turn in the barrel. I will not explain that. Um, Yeah, um, worrying. You gotta worry all the time. You gotta worry and you gotta be constantly communicating with the crew. Uh, usually, ideally it means you're just dealing with an AD who knows exactly what you need to do your thing and knows how long you need to do it, right? Um, 
but it might be a different person on the crew. Every film crew can be different, but ideally it's the AD. They have the directors here. They're keeping the whole thing running smoothly. Communication is uh, my other piece of advice, being really communicative about exactly how long stuff you're gonna do will take. Do not idealize, never overpromise. Never overpromise. Oh, it's like the military, never volunteer, never overpromise. You're better off underpromising and overdelivering. Way, way, way better. Because they'll never forget that you said you could do something that you couldn't do. Yeah, they never will forget that. Um, but I am delighted that you had a great time. Oh, elevator interior set. I wanted to tell you. So during the show, uh, we had Vince Gilligan. Uh, the executive producer uh, of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul on the show twice. And we kicked off a friendship that continues to this day. Vince is amazing. Uh, and uh, because he was one of the key writers on X-Files, which is such an important part of my, my 20s, uh, I kept, on, between takes and between stuff, I kept on peppering him with questions about X-Files. And the specific X-Files episode that I wanted to talk about, this is one of my all-time favorites, is late. I think it's the penultimate season. It's the time travel episode, which in which there's four acts, each one between commercial breaks, and each act is, act is a single shot. Um, super ambitious episode. So, And part of it takes place in the 40s in the Bermuda Triangle with like a past version of Scully, if I remember correctly. And some of it takes place in modern times. And in the modern times, there's a single shot where Mulder and Skinner walk into the FBI building, get in the elevator, turn around. The elevator door is closed. They have a conversation. The elevator door is open. They get back out. And I said, how did you guys do that shot? And Vince said, that was a Chris Carter thing. They literally redressed the entire soundstage in the like 70 seconds while uh, Mulder and Skinner were in the elevator. Yeah, so like those doors close and like a hundred Teamsters and crewmen, I had to come out, move all these desks and everything. Sorry, I did some resetting on some parts of my um, anvil yesterday and I did not put them back together correctly, so one just fell. At any rate, I love the idea that that elevator shot from X-Files, that there's like 150 people working furiously on the other side of those doors while that shot's happening. It, it gives it a kind of um, a delightful friction. Mooncake says, what was the most artistically challenging film you were involved in? Artistically challenging film that I was involved in. See, that's a tough question to answer because for the most part, all of my jobs in film were jobs of execution, not of design. So from an artistic standpoint, I am simply getting a drawing and instructions and I'm building what is being desired. So that's a different kind of challenge than I would think of like having to solve an aesthetic, an aesthetic artistic problem from a point of responsibility in that film. That was not my position when I was working in the film industry. I was still, you know, like a model supervisor by the time I moved on to Mythbusters. Uh, but only just. <laughs> yeah, it was, I was at Industrial Light Magic for five and a half years, but it wasn't until my last gig, which came after we shot the pilots for Mythbusters in late 02, that I, that, uh, uh, I got hired as a supervisor for Terminator 3 uh, for a specific set, the, uh, the, the particle accelerator set. I was having trouble remembering the phrase particle accelerator. Old brain. Um, okay, let's see here. We have. Ian Rigby says, when you did the Starfield build, you went to an incredible sound studio to do the filming where they had LED screens like the volume that they shoot Mandalorian and a bunch of new Disney Star Wars projects on. He continues, their technology and technical abilities were absolutely amazing. What do you think has been the most important technical innovation in filmmaking in recent years? Um, it's processing cycles. <laughs> That's it. Um, uh, the faster computers, the faster computers get, the more they allow us to do things that were previously impossible. Image, image compression and modulation and attenuation that 
would just not be feasible with computers from even five years ago. Um, but really specifically, the technology I love is the stuff coming out of uh, what Favreau and those guys are doing, Dave Filoni are doing for Disney. Because they're, they're not just making great shows for Disney with great characters and lovely plots and sort of continuing the Star Wars legacy in a great way. Um, they are also creating a palette of tools which are being disseminated through the industry that refine and compress the ideation and execution parts of the process to a degree that's wonderful. Um, what the volume has, what the volume allowed them to do in Mandalorian is incredible. And what it's allowing filmmakers to consider is really thrilling. And I, all of that is born out of like how to tell bigger stories with smaller budgets, right? Like commerce is always going to ask you to lower your budget. They're never going to, don't get me wrong, there are occasionally times when you have a big hit, you get plenty of money to make your thing. But for the most part, uh-uh. In fact, these days when companies have a hit, they lower the budgets for their shows um, in the subsequent seasons because their thought is you already know how to make it and we want all the money now. I'm not kidding. Subsequent seasons of hit shows are getting less money to make their shows than they did last season. That's not across the board and that's not comprehensive, but I know that's happening. Um, so commerce, late stage capitalism is always going to be like crunching against you. That's fine. That's one of the limitations of filmmaking. And what Filoni and Favreau and their team are doing is responding to that with ingenuity. John Knoll and the technical team at Industrial Light and Magic is responding to that challenge with ingenuity. And they are realizing they are the ones who I feel like were the first ones to peek above the clouds and be like, dude, we could use all these processing cycles to do a whole bunch of work for us. And like, it is a thrilling moment. Yeah. That's my favorite technical innovation in film these days, the stuff that uh, Favreau and his team are doing. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects questions, you get to ask direct questions during my live streams, and we have some members-only videos, including the Adam real-time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.